of a study of Piper Lane in Nissaquag. Uh, half an hour was spent on this the first time, and we've gotten the basics uh, in, and we're going to continue. I'm going to continue and explain to you about how you do these uh, apparently quite complex uh, landscapes from uh, a uh, tape uh, projected on a monitor. You can do the same thing. You can, uh, a lot of people, um, most people have VCRs and most people, many, many, many people have uh, camcorders, which means that they can go out, find a scene they like, shoot it and go back to their own environment and sit and paint from a monitor. That's exactly what I'm doing here in the studio. So if I'm able to do it, certainly uh, you are also. This is a wonderful scene shot on a brilliant, sunny, wonderful, crisp uh, autumn day uh, in an area right in the locale here, it is a lesson in perspective. You will notice that the uh, composition is this is a horizontal line going di uh, going across the page, which is known uh, in this painting as. Harbor Road, and I'm going to paint Harbor Road in right now. Sometimes it was catching some light from the sunshine coming from the south, which is where the sun is in the uh, fall and in the winter. And the the, um, the Harbor Road was illuminated in places. This is going to be probably unpainted in most areas, but because um, but I want you to know that this is the way I lay this out. Then these diagonals, which make for an illusion of distance, and then this this hig. Um, uh, Piper Lane, which is the name of it, is this dip in the road. Actually, the uh, the layout is maybe a little bit incorrect. There was a dip in this lane here, and therefore it should be laid out this way. Dip uh, the, the the road dip down. So, oh, yes, yeah, down, uh, down and up. So um, I've gotten the background. The sky was done. I've gotten the uh, I've gotten the distant uh, growth in the background, very fuzzy, virtually indistinct. And then we're working towards the foreground to put the uh, brilliantly colored trees in this little lane picture, which I uh, which I found absolutely enchanting uh, on a wonderful day recently in um, during this fall season. The um, the tree on the right has got to have some uh, attention paid to it for uh, obvious reasons because I'm working towards the foreground. Some trees turn scarlet, some trees turn red, purple, uh, literally dark purple, uh, alizarin crimson, and so on across the gamut. The only things the trees uh, the trees do not turn at this season is blue. Uh, I find that the variety of color is absolutely uh, indescribable. So if there is a desire in uh, in people's minds to go out and paint the fall foliage, remember that um, the variety of color is uh, told in your palette. You cannot paint with five colors on your palette, uh, no matter what the other programs are telling you five colors, uh, namely um, blue and red and the lizard and crimson and Van Dyke brown and white and black is out, of, uh, is, 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 is okay. I mean, those colors I use also, but they must be supplemented by uh, a larger variety. I have approximately 15 to 17 colors on my palette. I've prepared a sheet that you can get from the uh, local station here if you write uh, of what the colors to, to, to acquire when if you begin to, uh, to decide to work in oils, uh, there is a prepared uh, helpful sheet. All right, I've gotten that much put in for that particular brilliant tree, but I believe there was also a um, birch, and birches are notorious for their white, wonderful trunks. And I think just by putting in a few of these uh, of these white trunks, you'll be able to uh, uh, to. Uh, 
without too much being said, I mean, I'm not going to dwell on it, but they are sort of wiggly trunks. Uh, they, um, they grow, um, multiple, uh, multiple trunks grow together. And there happens to be a nice stand of these trees out there right now. There are many of them. We are not doing a study of birch trees. They just happen to be incidental to the landscape, but they have to go in. And also, as long as I've got that trunk, I have to supply it with some kind of foliage. And probably, it's probably the same type of foliage as in the, um, as the one next to it. So it's just a question of interpretation when you are dealing with as many complex uh, areas as this particular painting. The whole side, the right side of this picture is going to be occupied by vines and silhouetted um, poison ivy and you name it, uh, broken trees and branches and so on, which is what makes the charm. Um, over on the right side of the canvas here, uh, I'm going to prepare the, um, the to, to receive the um, brilliance of a yellow tree, and I want to make this all quite dark. Uh, there is still some green evident in this area, uh, even though the, tre the deciduous trees are turning uh, pale yellow and so on, or half turn pale yellow. There are still uh, many uh, stands of evergreens, and this evergreen is going to be um, ready to receive the... Uh, the brilliant uh, yellow, uh, uh, orange, I believe that is actually a rather large oversized maple on the left side of this canvas. All right, so we have here the possibility of completing in a, in a half an hour a painting that should would ordinarily take me anywhere between six and eight. It's rough. It is not a what you might call a fine arts painting, but it's a, it's, it, it is an acceptable demonstration piece. I'm working with color almost directly from the uh, um, from the uh, uh, tube, uh, because the purity of the colors is what's going to give you the uh, the uh, the essence of this painting. Up here is this um, are the shadow parts of this maple that are hanging out over the uh, over this little lane. Uh, remember that uh, a yellow tree is yellow only when the sun hits the leaves. For the rest of the time, they're more than likely going to be uh, dark and they're going to be in shadow. So uh, the anatomy of a tree is important to understand, and also how do they fall out and over the uh, landscape. This one, these trees are going in a circle. Uh, these are in a sort of a crown, and these uh, branches are f hanging in a... Um, in a type of, in, in a kind of a swag. So uh, the uh, the anatomy of the tree is to be paid attention to, not just to trying to uh, ho hopefully put a whole bunch of uh, color on the canvas and hope that it looks like a tree. I am I like to think that all of these uh, things are, that are done are purposeful, purposefully done with deliberate movements. So here, there is the dark part, and now comes the actual um, fun and amazing part of 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 um, of. Uh, uh, applying in thick uh, technique the leaves of this uh, of this tree that is brilliantly lit by the sun and the um, the pale orange this is yellow orange right out of the tube uh, is is um, the the dark background is beginning to tell you why the dark background was put in so that these brilliant colors can stand out uh, against the dark background which is exactly what my uh, re reference material is telling me um, I'm going to introduce some yellow because the sun plays tricks even on yellow on orange leaves it turns some of them yellow yellow, as well as uh, nature turns uh, some of the orange ones yellow. No matter how orange a tree looks, you can be sure that somewhere in there, there is a, uh, there is a yellow leaf. Um, as you can see, the, dark, uh, the darkness of that background is extremely dramatic and very helpful to make these trees stand out. And um, this is about how, uh, how far this, uh, this hangs. I'm going to take my layout brush again, the one that has got the very fine bristle, and I'm going to show you how uh, one or two branches in there are going to make a great deal of sense. It's going to tell you that these things are not just growing uh, and, 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 and um, hanging loose in midair. They have to come from somewhere. And uh, the branches are, are, are a vital uh, part of the story. I see many painting shows have, uh, have uh, just uh, color sort of dabbed onto the screen, and you're expected to believe that those, are, uh, those leaves are just are, are floating in the air. You must supply the logic for these paintings. Um, 
Down, uh, as, as, as I approach the lower part of the canvas, uh, there is a wonderful dark streak here way off in the distance, and it's uh, more than likely part of Harbor Road. It, uh, it seems to cut that, um, that uh, pale, uh, light-struck part of the road uh, uh, with a good dark streak that is crossing Higby, uh, not Higby Lane, Piper Lane. Sorry, I don't know where Higby Lane comes in, but I think that we did one, uh, one time called Higby Lane. Here is the Harbor Road that's now been reduced to just a little sliver of light. Now, and the rest of it is going to be uh, a dark area uh, obliterating the road uh, forever. There you go, obliterating this, obliterating this road. <clears throat> And all of this darkness back here is also getting rid of the road. But uh, you, but I try to work with a certain logic uh, that the Harbor Road has got to go in a horizon, horizontal line across my canvas, and therefore I put it all the way. If I take it out later, it is, um, it's normal. I'm going to remove it with my palette knife because there's a lot of paint there that I don't want to um, um, worry me later. Uh, as I say, if you drop your palette on your lap, you're in deep trouble. Here I have, um, I have now the beginning of introducing these little wonderful fla flaming trees that are the point of this picture. The little trees that are uh, becoming larger as they get nearer to you, the point of perspective is what it is. Let me put, uh, let me mix up on my palette here with this uh, amazing color called geranium lake mixed with a little bit of spectrum orange for the brilliance of those trees. This geranium lake is, a, is what you call a really funky, glamorous color. I must have it when I'm doing this, these foliage things because the brilliance of the color is is essential in the uh, in the interpreting of these trees. The little uh, the little uh, trunk of that tree, which is pale in the sunlight, uh, I'm going to simply put in to show you where I'm placing it. The little trunk of the tree is right there. There's another little tree uh, tree trunk here. It's taller, and as they come towards you, they become taller and taller. Well, I'm, I think I better uh, start to squish them together. Uh, this little tree has uh, has uh, just barely a, uh, a suggestion of leaves on it, but you can see what happens when it gets put against that darker green background. The one next to it uh, plays right into it. They are both uh, they're next to one another, therefore they the col the colors overlap, and so on up the road there uh, as you're watching your uh, as you're watching your monitor you will see the uh, that we have re-rolled the tape and the figure is is going past it and these what I call little trees are now understandably very close to uh, <clears throat> 12 to 15 feet tall assuming that that human figure is six feet tall so uh, when I talk about scale and the importance of scale there it's demonstrated right in front of you that the importance of telling the story completely completely with a human figure. Um, I'm, I'm working my way toward the viewer. The trees are becoming taller because they're getting uh, closer to you. I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm picking up some of the green, but I'm putting the paint on so thick that it does not, it is not affecting the look of the tree. And they are losing their leaves. So there is a, there is a uh, sort of a lacy quality to them. I'll get back to this a little bit later. And finally, the one that is the closest to me is quite brilliant. It has a lot of uh, reds and oranges and so on in it. And it is more understandable uh, because it is closer and there is less uh, difficulty fusion about size. So this uh, tree has uh, the, uh, the gamut of the fall colors in it, uh, including the colors of the shadow leaves as well. Uh, remember, no matter how small a thing may be, it casts a shadow. Uh, and even if it's just one single leaf, uh, and uh, enough leaves casting a shadow will make for a dark area. Uh, I hope that uh, I'm not uh, just, you know, babbling on, and uh, I hope that some of this information is actually uh, uh, of information and of use to the people who are interested in doing uh, painting uh, uh, in a realistic manner, and I assume that anybody who watches this carefully and faithfully are interested, in fact, in doing 
uh, just that. Uh, the, uh, the use of color, the use of technique, the use of layout and composition and proportion is what the whole thing is about. This is not just to produce a painting, this is to produce a lesson, which of course is uh, in its own way uh, timeless. Lessons are in fact timeless. You can go back over them and repetition being the best teacher means that these, uh, these uh, um, shows can be used over and over again because one does tend to forget uh, details. So here is the uh, here is the introduction of the shadow of these trees um, as they go away from you. The ones that you see on your monitor are yellow, and the ones that I see on my monitor are more amber and pink in tone. Um, uh, the transmission, of course, in television sometimes is tricky. If I'm seeing these in in orange, doesn't mean that I'm colorblind. It means that that's what I'm seeing on my monitor. Uh, you, of course, may be seeing blue and uh, I mean yellow, and that means that you would wonder about my selection of color. It just depends upon how I'm seeing it from my monitor. Okay, so as long as I've gotten that clear, and I hope it doesn't confuse anybody too much, but it's, uh, it's an understandable um, event that uh, I'm going to be working from what I see, and uh, the fact that they are uh, amber and copper in tone means that that's the way I'm going to interpret them. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't fool anybody or try to make people think that I'm seeing something that is not there. Uh, these, uh, this is the dark background of that alley, but it's also got a lot of lawn in it and a lot of very pale green coming across here. And I'll put those, uh, I'll put those uh, little trunks back in, back in again. Uh, the uh, the green is uh, still evident because um, it's the trees that turn, not the grass. The grass has yet to turn uh, orange and uh, scarlet and so on. Yeah, green tends to turn to stay green until it becomes. Uh, tan and ochre and loses its color entirely to the winter. Um, so here all of this nice pale green being struck by the sun, which is coming from the south, uh, southwest at three, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. This is the, uh, this is the preparing, this is not only painting what I see, but also preparing the uh, background for the, for the uh, dark uh, vine-like uh, things that are uh, growing on the side here. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, break for just a moment and uh, return to you in a short period of time. We always take a break in the middle, so don't go away. I'll be back. of this study of a fall scene here in the local area called <clears throat> Piper Lane in uh, Nissaquag. Um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the need to work in layers in landscape painting is evident in this one. I mean, you work from back to front and you, uh, you attempt to uh, 
to, uh, to uh, work with um, uh, contrasts. And so the contrasts that are here, I'm putting in the paleness of the road, uh, of the lane rather, um, so that I can, so that I'm sort of preparing to throw the shadows across the road and to, um, to uh, give the feeling of uh, the intensity of the light, which is what happens when you are in a uh, late afternoon sun and the shadows are very long and very dark. Uh, this uh, this harbor road here in the distance is an extremely dark shadow, except for apparently a little shaft of light that has managed to hit the road, the sun uh, having maybe um, been free of one of the big trees or the bushes and so on. So laying this, uh, this uh, lane out is uh, in order to be able to receive the... Um, the shadows that are running across the road. The shadows tend to be somewhat mauve or purple at this time of year, and so um, let's just see whether or not that works. Uh, this one is a little bit too dark. I'm going to uh, I'm going to lighten it and just introduce a little bit of of, of purple. It, it may be a little bit too subtle for the um, for the uh, television camera, but here is this. See this shadow on the green here has got to uh, b uh, go with the shadow across the road, but the shadow across the road. Is is a different color because it's uh, hitting a different uh, shadows being transparent it is hitting a different tone so th this shadow being dark green and this one is going to be a little bit darker than the shadow of the road uh, something which happens uh, many many times and which is not paid attention to enough uh, so I'm always glad to be able to have the opportunity to point this out as I go along that the shadows have got to be uh, logical. Now, there is a shadow that is going to be coming from this small uh, trunk here. Let me put the pale trunks in again. They're being struck by the light. Uh, as you can see, they will cross that shadow and this one and maybe this final one here. The uh, shadow on the grass uh, from this little tree is dark green, but it's going to cross the road and it's going to become uh, the deep mauve. Let me put another shadow in and let me put another one in. Maybe it's in the monitor, maybe it isn't. This is an object lesson. These little shadows are uh, important just to illustrate a point. Uh, somewhere along the line they may have been lost in the subject matter, but it, this is an instructional thing and I need to, I need to explain this. Um, here is uh, here's the shadow here. It becomes diffused apparently, uh, but there is nevertheless it becomes diffused because there's a bump in the road or something. But here is the mauvish shadow of this of this little tree right here. Uh, logically, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. Here is another uh, little. Um, here is this tree trunk is is in shadow running across here, and the tree is low and it's short, and therefore it's does not go all the way across the road. And this one continues uh, with its own shadow and the darkness of that tree. Uh, it, it may not be exa exactly visible in the monitor because of various uh, bumps in the road, but, I, but you've got to know that this is what happens. Uh, and when you're out there, you'll observe it, especially when the light changes. Uh, the light changed apparently while we, were, uh, while we were taping this, and these little pieces of information were, were gone. There is also a rather large... Uh, 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 shadow being c cast across the road in the foreground here from a large tree that is uh, invisible to uh, to us because it's way over in the distance, but its shadow is visible, and uh, its shadow runs across the green in a dark gr across the lawn in a dark green. Once again, illustrating the business of what shadows do. Um, time, of course, is uh, is running out. It's uh, it it always does and I must make sure that that remains dark there and so on. Um, the, little, uh, the little trees in the foreground on the left side of the picture, uh, it's exactly the same technique as this one, uh, except that it just happens to be a row of them they have to remain absolutely brilliant. This darkness here is helping to uh, prepare the background to receive these brilliant tones. Uh, you can introduce many reds and copper tones and even possibly some... Um, some uh, Ochre. Uh, all of these little trees are one right behind each other. Therefore, we don't have in the illusion of distance because they're all they're all um, overlapping one another. But they're there, and um, uh, with a little bit more time, I would probably be able to make a nice differentiation between the two. However, we are once again uh, prisoners of the clock. Um, however, this little this, these little trees here in the front. This is about all that I can take the time to show you. And with the few remaining moments, let me. Uh, 
um, let me go into the, uh, the pale greenness of this, uh, of this lawn because it's, it is in line with the road, the pale green of the road. Here's the pale green of the road. Uh, you know, everything that is struck in light has a logic to it. Only, only possible to analyze and to comprehend if you work from life, if you work right out there in the field, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the way I continuously and tirelessly make the point of uh, using reference material from life. You will see that these shadows are very logical. They, uh, the, the green shadow is dark green uh, on the lawn, and the Movis shadow is the dark of the road. The thing left to do here is to attend to how to handle this enormous amount of of side growth. It has become uh, virtually uh, uh, silhouetted against the sky. Once again, we're dealing with the anatomy of a tree, the anatomy of, a, of an evergreen and that is growing, and it's very dark, and uh, there are some light places beyond it. But for the most part, this whole area in the foreground here would be put in in a very dark tone, and then the details would be added on later. I don't mean that to be black at all. I'm going to put it in a... In a, in a, in a preparation of a dark tone so that I can do the details of the foreground later. Uh, this little tree is now obliterated by the darkness of the of the foreground growth and it over it uh, overlaps it. Um, a little bit of turpentine helps to make the uh, make the um, paint flow a little bit more smoothly. Here is the uh, here are the foreground growths of of things that are growing. These are growing up. The other ones were hanging down, and so paying attention to all these various um, shapes tell you the kind of uh, of. Uh, uh, foliage you're dealing with. You're either dealing with a vine or you're dealing with a bush or a tree. It's all got to do with the manner in which they send out their branches. Um, this has all got to be eliminated because we've got growth in front of it. Um, over here, before the time really runs out too, mo too, too quickly, uh, and it is running out quickly, means that the, um, the uh, let me... Uh, tell you that it's the, the these vines and branches of poison ivy are very uh, are important for the for the comprehension of where you are there are vines that are hanging down over the left side the right side of this picture with the silhouetted leaves all over them and they are to be attended to with as much care as the rest of them this whole thing is a uh, is a uh, tree that has been covered with uh, vines and it is virtually black. It still has a little bit of lacy look about it, and the, um, the need for time to interpret this uh, is obvious. Uh, you cannot do this in a matter of seconds. Uh, there is a rather large trunk here that is going to be uh, uh, semi-covered with the vines, but it nevertheless does come on this side of the picture. And all of this is extremely dark, uh, and it's going to work very well against the pale of the sunstruck trees in the, uh, in the uh, background. So uh, the, the, the lessons are merely repeated. You re things tend to repeat themselves. The dark and the light working from life, the sun as opposed to the shadow, is all here in one scene. Uh, and it, and it, uh, it is merely uh, that time and time again uh, taking place uh, as you paint in various areas, no matter what the landscape is, it is still the same approach. You deal with light and shade, contrasts, dark, light striking things, and shadows. So uh, uh, I can't make it any clearer than to tell you that th there is no trick to this. It is a um, it is a uh, it is a pattern that happens wherever you are, whether you're painting mountains or Long Island uh, lanes in a country setting. It is the same approach to observation and painting from life, and being sure that you can understand what you're looking at and decipher it, and then apply it. Let me just as I as I wind up try to put that little figure in that uh, was walking down the road. I'm not sure that I can pull it off, but as I recall, the figure was about this tall compared to that tree. He was in somewhat silhouette. It's probably, probably a fool's errand to do this. But here is a silhouetted figure, uh, shoulders, uh, general walking, the, the, the legs walking forward, maybe uh, doing this, and casting a shadow. 
casting a shadow as the figure walks. Uh, if the, everybody has a shadow, including the figure. This is, uh, this is very quickly done, but it is an object lesson. I believe that the figure had a white shirt on or a very pale shirt, and that would, can be put in. Uh, the sunny side of the figure is over here, therefore the white of the shirt is going to be on that side. The rest of it will be in shadow. But there was a figure with a um, with a, a pale shirt. Okay. Uh, once again, I am uh, I am attempting to do the impossible, namely a ten or a twelve hour painting in the space of a half an hour. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. Um, this is a charming. Uh, Thing to be able to uh, instruct. I like to be able to give all this information as quickly as I possibly can to you and hope that you absorb it. Thank you for watching. This is me, Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel, signing off. <laughs>